Assalamu alaikum YouTube, this is Imran here, the FOT Foundation. It's been a while, I've been away, um, but I'm back. This is a video response to Converted to Islam, which is a YouTube channel run by Ishmael Abu Adam. This is a brother who's been Muslim for 16 years, and he states that in the last few years he's been bothered by reoccurring issues and criticisms. And he says if asked the question specifically why he has left Islam, left Islam, his answer would be that the Quran and Muhammad, peace be upon him, their teaching specifically on, on in terms of moral standards and conduct, he now finds indef indefensible. He says that he's tried to defend these criticisms in the past, but has found that they are based in early Islamic sources, therefore he feels they are valid. And now he has decided to share his doubts um, with YouTube. Um, he gives a claim about one of the issues uh, that has led him to apostate. He said there are many, but this is one. And he provides three pieces of evidence to bolster the claim. So I'll give his argument first, and then I'll try and uh, provide the evidence to the contrary. So his claim is this. He says that the Quran and Muhammad, peace be upon him, teach that it is permissible. He likes to say the word halal after saying permissible. Um, that it is permissible to capture and rape female war captives, even if they're married and even if their non-Muslim husbands are still alive and present. This is his claim. So he now provides two two initial pieces of evidence, followed by one further evidence, which is called, which he calls further investigation. So what's the evidence? The first evidence he gives is Surah 4, verse 24. There's a chapter in the Quran. Now Surah 4, verse 23 is specifically a list of those people who Muslim men cannot marry. And then Surah 4 continues, and also prohibited to you are all married women, except those whom your right hands possess. Now this is a small fraction of the of the complete ayah, but this is where he stops, and he states that this is evidence that the Quran allows Muslim men to have intercourse, sexual relations with married women. He then goes to the tafsir of Ibn Kathir, which is one of the most vast uh, tafsirs of the Quran, and he quotes from that as well, specifically about this verse. So I have that here, so let me read that to you. And this is uh, volume two, page number 422, specifically talking about that portion of the verse that he uh, was interested in. Also forbidden are women already married except those whom your right hand possess. The explanation here is, the ayah means that you are prohibited from marrying women who are already married. Except those whom your right hand possesses. And then the explanation is given, except those whom you acquire through war, for you are allowed such women after making sure they are not pregnant. Ibn Kathir then quotes a hadith from Imam Ahmad. Imam Ahmad recorded that Abu Sa'id al-Khudri said, we captured some women from the era of Altas. Altas was an area where the Battle of Hunayn take, like, took place. We captured some women from the era of Altas who were already married, and we disliked having sexual relations with them because they already had husbands. So we asked the Prophet, peace be upon him, about this matter, and this ayah was revealed. Also forbidden are women already married, except those whom your right hands possess. Consequently, we had sexual relations with these women. This is the wording recorded in At-Tirmidhi, Al-Nisa'i, Ibn Jarir, and Muslim and Isahih. Then Brother Ishmael states that Muslims might be in shock at this moment. Um, at the knowledge that the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him have taught such sexual immorality, they may be trying to find a positive interpretation for these verses, or they may be even thinking that Ibn Kathir got it wrong. He then says that when I investigate further, things become worse, and he provides one other piece of evidence to say that uh, things are becoming worse. And this is the quote from uh, the hadith found in Surah Nabi Dawood. So this is volume 2, hadith number 2155. And I'll read it for you now. It says, Abu Sayyid al-Khudri narrated that the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, sent an expedition of Altas on the day of Hunayn, and they met with the enemy, fought them, and won the battle. They captured some slaves, but some of the companions of the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him, felt uncomfortable in, the relation, in having relations with them because of their pagan husbands. At this, Allah revealed and chased women, free women, except for those whom your right hand possesses, meaning that they are allowed for you after their waiting periods have finished, and this is considered sahih. So he then makes a conclusion, and he says this, How would you feel if the women in your family were captured 
were forced to divorce, were forced to marry enemy soldiers, were forced to have sexual relations with enemy soldiers, whom she obviously hated. Uh, and all this happened whilst the husband was still alive. Um, and then he states that no sane person could in, in his or her right mind defend the Quran or Muhammad peace upon him on this issue. And he says this is one of the reasons why he left Islam. Now I find this very surprising for somebody who claims to have studied Islam for 16 years, has claimed to have investigated allegations and criticisms further to come with the conclusion that uh, Abu Adam has come with. Um, it's bizarre. But let's look, let's examine the argument. And I'm going to make four basic points. The first point is this, that this is an implicit argument. This argument is based on insinuation and assertion. There are no explicit statements of anywhere to be found in any of the writings, either in the Quran or in the Hadith, that any forced sexual intercourse with any war captive women has ever taken place. Number two, the claim that Abu Adam is making goes against the recorded history of the incidents of Al Das. History of that incident, what would happen immediately after the battle, what happened to these women in the end, all go against the claim that Abu Adam is making. Number three, the claim that Abu Adam is making specifically goes against explicit statements in the Quran and explicit statements of the Prophet Muhammad peace upon him and explicit rulings by his companions about how to deal with captured women in war and slaves in general. Number four, the claim that Abu Adam is making also goes against the known rights of the war captives as laid out by early classical scholars and I'll provide evidences for that. So let's get into this. So let me deal with the first point in a bit more detail. This argument is an implicit argument and what do I mean by this? That this is based upon furtive imagination and suggestions and insinuations but there are actually no explicit statements at all to say that any war captive who was female was ever raped by any Muslim man. Now what I'm not saying here is that absence of evidence means that there is evidence of absence. No, quite the contrary. What I'm saying here is is that there is lots of evidence to state that whenever there was any sexual impropriety there were quite significant repercussions for the assaulter um, and so women who were war captives specifically were protected from this sort of behavior um, and were never raped um, and that evidence will be forthcoming as I further elaborate upon the three remaining points so this is a challenge to Abu Adam if you're going to make a positive argument if you're going to make the claim that Islam uh, the Quran and the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, allow rape of war captives. All you need to do is provide one example from the Hadith of a woman being raped by a Muslim man that was condoned by the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, or condoned by the Quran, or condoned by the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him. And that's a challenge to you. Um, and I'm speaking indirectly through you to those people who make the allegations that you have found so hard to defend. So now to deal with point two. Now point two is very important because it deals with the historicity of the events of the Battle of Hunayn and what happened at al -Dars. And Abu Adam's claim is completely refuted by examining the history of the events. And there are four things that I want to mention specifically and I'll provide the evidence for those. First thing, that um, the men who came to fight the Prophet upon him at al -Dars, had brought their women and children with them to the battlefield. That's the first point. The second point that I want to make that all the men, when they were losing the battle, fled, leaving the women and children in the battlefield. The third point is that the women, on the vast majority of women, were not distributed amongst the men as war booty because the Prophet, peace upon him, was waiting for a specific event to occur. And third, fourth, and most importantly, all of the women and children were freed and returned to their families after the event. Amazing, amazing piece of history. There's clearly evidence if you want to do further investigation and completely refute the idea that Abu Adam is putting forward uh, based upon his uh, concerns. So let me give you the evidence for that. And this is uh, from the Kitab al-Tabaqat al-Kabir um, and this is um, recorded by Ibn Sa'd and he died circa 845 and on page 185 of his second volume 
this is what it says. The narrator said, When the Apostle of Allah conquered Mecca, the notables of Hawazin and Thaqif moved from one side to the other. They assembled and rose in rebellion. Malik ibn Awf al Nasri had brought them together and he was then 30 years old. He ordered them and they brought with them their wealth, their women folk, and their children. They mobilized the Altas and the supporters were coming to them. They agreed on marching against the Apostle of Allah. So, first piece is evidenced that the women and children were brought to the battlefield by the tribes that tried to attack the Prophet, peace be upon him, or they were planning to attack the Prophet, peace be upon him. So, the second, the second part uh, is that um, the, the men fled, leaving the women alone. And this is recorded. Um, by uh, al Jassus, and this is found in Ahkam al Quran, uh, volume 2, page 173. Uh, and al Jassus reports Muhammad ibn Ali narrated, When it was the day of Al Tas, the disbeliever men fled to the mountains and their women were taken as captives. So, again, clearly the men had brought the women to the, and the children to the battlefield. When they started to lose, the, ones that, the men that were still alive fled into the mountains. And this is how the women's what women and children were taken as captives. Um, so the husbands weren't with them when they were captured, contrary to the claim and the statements made by Abu Adam in his video. Now, this is where it gets very interesting. I said the vast majority of the women and children were not distributed amongst the people by the Prophet because he was waiting for a certain event to occur. And then I also said that and all the women and children were returned to their families. And I'll give you two pieces of evidence for this. So I'll read this to you. And this is again from al Tabaqat Al-Kabir, Volume 2, but this is now page 188 to 190. And this is again recorded by Ibn Sa'd in Who Died Circa 845. And I'll read it out for you. There were 6,000 slaves, 24,000 camels, and more than 40,000 goats, and 4,000 uqyas of silver. The Apostle of Allah delayed the distribution of slaves, lest a deputation might wait upon him to obtain, obtain their freedom. So all this lists the war booty that was attained, um, the camels, the goats, the gold, and the women and children. But the Prophet peace be upon him delayed distributing the women and the children, specifically because he was waiting for and hoping for the return of the, fa of the, the men to claim their women back, a deputation. And I'll continue reading. A deputation of the Hawazin waited in on the Prophet. They were 14 persons, and, and their head was Zubair bin Surad. Among them was Abu Burqan, the foster uncle of the Apostle. They begged him to be generous with them regarding the captives. He, the Prophet, asked them whether your children and women are driven to you or your wealth. So the Prophet, peace be upon him, gave them a choice. They said, We do not consider anything equal to our women and children. Thereupon he, the Prophet, said, Whatever belongs to me and to the family of Abu al-Muttalib is yours, and I shall ask of the people about their shares. So the Prophet said, I will return anything that I have, and I'll ask the people about the shares. These people came as submitters, or Muslims, and this is why I have delayed the distribution of the captives. I have offered them a choice, and they do not consider anything equal to their women and children. So he who possesses any slave should return him cheerfully. He who is not willing to return should also return. And it, is, will, and it will be a debt, debt upon us to be repaid from those 6,000 shares of spoils. They, and this is the Muslims who the Prophet peace him, had asked to return the, the slaves back. We agreed to it and surrender. Then they returned the captured women, none backing out except Uyayna ibn Hizn, who denied to return the old woman who had fallen to his share. Subsequently, he returned her also. Um, so this is one piece of evidence. So the women were not distributed uh, on the whole. And when the deputation came... Uh, requesting the women back, the Prophet peace upon him returned them. Now you have to imagine this scenario. The Prophet peace upon him has everything in his hands. The people who are coming have nothing. He has already defeated them in battle. He has their wealth. He has their families. What does he do? He still gives them a choice. We will keep your wealth and you can take your women, or you can take your wealth and we'll keep your women, one thing or the other. In fact, he could have said, I don't want to give you anything. But he was magnanimous. And these people chose to have their families back, which is what you'd expect them to do. And they were given their families back. The second piece of evidence, and this is a uh, hundred years earlier. This is from 
uh, Kitab al maghazi page 107 to 109, and this is by uh, Ma'amur ibn Rashid. When the Hawazin came back before the Messenger of God, they said, You are the most upright and faithful in honouring bonds of kinship, but our women and those in our care have been taken captive and our wealth seized. The Messenger of God replied, I patiently abided my time for you, and with me are those you see. To me, the most preferable speech is the most honest, so choose one of two, either the property or the captives. O Messenger of God, they replied, as far as we are concerned, if you force us to choose between property and honour, we shall choose honour. And they said, we esteem honour above all else. Thus they chose their women and their children. The Prophet rose to address the Muslims. He first glorified God, as is God's due. And then he proceeded to say, as for the matter at hand, these men, your brethren, have come as as those who surrendered themselves, and we have given them a choice between their offspring and their property. They regarded nothing as equal to their honour. This I have seen fit for you to return their women and children to them. Whoever wishes to act so magnanimously, let him do so, and whoever wishes to demand compensation for his share so that we may give him a portion of what God has granted us as spoils, let him do so. The Muslims answered God's messenger, the judgment is good. The Prophet says, I do not know who has permitted that and who has not, so command your leaders to convey this information to us. Once the leaders had informed the Messenger of God that the people had acquiesced to the agreement, acquiesced to the agreement the, and permitted it, God's Messenger returned the women and children to the Hawazin clan. God's Messenger also granted to the women whom he had given to several Qureshi men the choice between remaining in the household of those men or returning to their families. Amazing. So not only were the women and children freed and given back to their families, but actually they were given the choice to go back. So it wasn't just go back to your families, but if you want to go, you can go back. If you want to stay, you can stay. Now, would you offer that to? Uh, would you offer that choice to anybody who'd been through rape? It doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So this is this historical collection of information and recording of the events completely debunks uh, Abu Adam's arguments. It shows that the men, w women and children were brought to the battlefield by the uh, opposing clans. It shows that all the men fled, leaving the women on their own, so their husbands and were not with them when they were captured. It shows that no women were essentially distributed apart from a, a few, and that all the women and children were returned to their families. Um, when their husband, when their families came to ask for them as a group. Point number three. Now this point specifically deals with the claims brought by Abu Adam uh, that have led to his doubts um, by providing evidence from the Quran and also specific statements and rulings by the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him in the Hadith as well as specific rulings by the companions of the Messenger, may God be pleased with them. Um, that go against the notions that he has brought. So let me start by providing these evidences for you. So my first evidence will be a verse from the Quran, chapter 4, Surah An-Nisa, verse 36. And I'll read it to you now. Worship Allah and associate nothing with him, and to parents do good, and to relatives, orphans, the needy, the near neighbour, the neighbour further away, the companion at your side, the traveller, and those whom your right hands possess. Indeed, Allah does not like those who are self-deluding and boastful. So here we have a very clear statement of what from uh, God within the Quran that you have to worship Allah alone without partners. And then we are giving a list of nine groups of people who you have to do good to. So why is this relevant? And why is it relevant in this particular discussion? Because, as I will evidence later, rape is considered to be a crime and therefore is not a good thing. There is a clear instruction from God within the Quran to do good to those whom your right hands possess. And that obviously would preclude, exclude raping them, which is the opposite of that. And the second point that I'm going to make. Now, the second point is actually even more poignant a point. And it deals with uh, those under your care, including uh, the female slaves that you have. Um, and I'll read it. And this is chapter 24 of the Quran, um, Surah An-Nur, I believe it to be. Uh, chapter 24, yes, yeah, Surah An-Nur. And this is verse number 32. So let me read that to you. And it says, and, uh, and marry the unmarried among you, the righteous among your male slaves and female slaves. And this is a portion of the verse. Now, other translations will read, arrange the marriage of the spouseless among you and the capable from among your bonds of women and bondsmen, or bondsmen and bondswomen. 
Um, and this verse is actually about arranging the marriage of those whom your right hands possess. Um, and what is the evidence for that? Am I just making a, an interpretation on the general verse or looking at the verse in another way? No, I will give you evidence for that. So if you read Ma'rif um, al-Quran by um, uh, Muhammad Shafi, this is uh, in his sixth volume, page 423 and page 424, when dealing with this verse specifically, it says, and is an explanation, and this is very interesting to understand, so it is incumbent upon the masters of the slaves and the slave girls that they that those among them who have the ability to get married, their marriage should be arranged. It is purported to mean that it is purported here to mean that if they show their need and desire to get married, then according to some jurists, it is binding on the owners to marry them off. But the majority of the jurists have ruled that in such a situation, it is incumbent upon the masters not to place any hindrance in their marriage and allow them to get married, because the marriage of slaves and slave girls cannot be performed without the permission of their owners. Uh, the gist of all this is that the owners are instructed here not to make any delay in granting the permission of marriage of their subjects. So here we have a command from uh, the verse in the Quran which is explained as arrange the marriage of those who are in your care, who are your servants. Um, again, completely going against the notion of uh, women being captured for sexual objectification and sexual gratification. Uh, in fact, you're doing the opposite. You're uh, arranging for these men and for these women specifically to, if they desire, get married as they desire. Um, amazing, amazing. And we refute completely the idea that um, put forward by uh, Abu Adam uh, or from where he got his doubts from. Now, I'm going to give you a statement now from the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, about... Um, slave girls and specifically how to treat them and this is very interesting it's a hadith uh, from Sahih Bukhari book number 46 hadith number 720 and I'll read it out to you now uh, narrated by Abu Musa Allah's messenger said he who has a slave girl and educates and treats her nicely and then manumits her and marries her he will get a double reward so the command here is to if you have a slave girl and you educate you treat her well you manumit her, you free her, and then you marry her, you will get a double reward. So if these women were captured and they were just used for sexual gratification, as you as you will, irrespective of her wishes, these statements would hold no value and no purpose. This is clearly not what is being taught by Prophet Muhammad, peace upon him. And in fact, he treats, tr treats a much higher morality than maybe Abu Adam is aware. Uh, so the next piece of evidence, and the next piece of evidence is um, quite an interesting piece of evidence. This is looking at uh, someone who was mistreated by their owner. So here we have uh, a statement from uh, uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, or a report about the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, recorded in Sahih Muslim, Book 15. This is Hadith number 4082. Hilal bin Yasuf reported that a person got angry and slapped his slave girl, whereupon Suad bin Muqarin said to him, you could find no other part to slap but the prominent part of her face. See, I was one of the seven sons of Muqarin, and we had but one slave girl. The youngest of us slapped her, and Allah's messenger commanded us to set her free. So here we have uh, a, a, a slave girl who is owned, and her owners abused her by slapping her. And when this matter was brought to the attention of the Prophet, man, peace upon him, he ordered her to be freed. Uh, this is similar uh, uh, narration is also backed up by a, a transmission in uh, in uh, Dirmidhi. This is in volume 3, book 18, hadith number 1542, narrated by Suwaid bin Muqarin al-Muzayni. We were seven brothers without a servant except one, and one of us slapped her, so the Prophet ordered us to free her. Now, I want you to think about this. If... The Prophet Muhammad ordered the freeing of the slave girl just for merely being slapped. Do you think that he would have allowed her to be raped? Think about it. It does not make any sense. The argument being put forward does not make any sense whatsoever. Um, and let's look at an example uh, of a companion making a ruling about somebody who does have illicit sexual intercourse with a slave girl that had been captured in war. What happened? 
to that person. And this is recorded in Bay Hafiz Al Qubra uh, Hadith Collection, and this is in Volume Nine, Page One Seven Seven, Hadith Number One Eight Two Two Two. Khalid sent Diral bin Al Azwar in a party. They attacked an area of the tribe of Bani Asad. They captured a pretty woman. Dirar liked her, hence he asked his companions to grant her to him, and they did so. He then had sexual intercourse with her. When he completed his mission, he felt guilty and went to Khalid and told him what he had done. Khalid said, I permit her for you and make it lawful to you. He, Dirar said, no, not until you write to Umar about this. Khalid then informed Umar about this, and Umar wrote back saying that he, Dirar, should be stoned to death. By the time Umar's message reached Dirar, Dirar had already died, and Khalid said Allah did not want to disgrace Dirar, and which is why he died before the, the punishment could be carried out. But here we have a specific statement of an impropriety happening uh, in, in a battle. A woman is captured, one of the um, men liked the woman, and then he had her allocated to him in war booty, and then he actually had sexual relations with her. As soon as that was done, he knew he had done wrong, he felt guilty, he spoke to his commander and informed him, who tried to give him a way out. But actually the person said, no, I want you to inform the Khalif, who was Umar at the time. And Umar specifically gave a, 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 the ruling. He said, stone him to death, because he's, what he's done is, is not allowed in Islam. Uh, and what had he done? He had sexual relations with a slave girl um, when it was not his right to do so. And this, this again completely blows out of the water the claim brought by Abu Adam or those who where he gets his doubts from. So the last piece of evidence that I want to give you in this section is to do with what to do with somebody who does not please you from amongst your slaves. Uh, and the Prophet Muhammad uh, made a ruling here, and this is recorded in the Sunan of Abu Dawood, this is book number 41, hadith number 5142, there is another way of reference in this and I'll provide both references below for you. Uh, Abu Dar narrated, the Prophet peace be upon him said, feed those of your slaves whom please you from what you eat and clothe them with what you clothe yourselves, but sell those who do not please you and do not punish Allah's creatures. So the idea that you can somehow force somebody to have sexual intercourse with you when they don't desire it um, would go completely against the statement of the Prophet manifested upon him here. And rape, of course, would contradict the last part of that hadith. So here I have provided evidence from the Quran, from the hadith statements of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and companions as well about how to treat captors of war and slaves in general. These evidences completely refute the argument brought forward by Abu Adam. So now on to the fourth and final point, and this point really is to illustrate that the argument presented by Abu Adam completely contradicts the known rights of the war captives as laid out by the early Islamic scholars. And I'm going to make four sub-points in this, and I'll evidence those as I'll go. So let me begin. So Islam forbids the killing of women and children in war, and I'll give you two hadith to that clarify this. So the first one is from um, Sunan ibn Majah, and it comes from volume 4, book 24, and hadith number 2841, and I'll read it to you now. It was narrated from Ibn Umar that the Prophet, peace be upon him, saw a woman who had been killed on the road, and he forbade killing women and children. This is one hadith, and another one along the similar lines. Abdullah bin Masood said, A woman was found slain in one of the battles of the Apostle of Allah. The Apostle of Allah forbade to kill women and children. This is Sunan Abi Dawood, Book 14, Hadith 2662. Why is that important in this particular uh, discussion? Well, killing women and children is an option that some peoples of the past have taken in war scenarios. This is not an option open to Muslims because it's been specifically forbidden, which is why then they're not abandoned in hostile environment, in a theatre of war, they're taken to a place of security and safety. And this is very important as it sets out the reason why captives were taken. There were no formal prison systems at that time and the, what would then happen is that the government of the time would allocate any war captives to households within the society um, to act as servants, essentially. Obviously this is better than killing them and this is better than abandoning them. 
to the second point. Imam Abu Hanifa, Imam Malik, and Imam Ash-Shaybani, who was the student of Imam Abu Hanifa, all hold the opinion, and these are very early Islamic scholars, all hold the opinion that if a husband and wife are ca- captured together in battle, then their marriage is deemed to be continuing, and no, obviously then no sexual relations are allowed with, with either of them. So let me give you the evidence for that. And this is a quote from Kitab al-Siyar al by um, Imam al-Shaybani, and I'll quote, this is from page 51. When the army takes a woman captive, followed by her husband, who was also taken captive, sooner or later, and either the woman does not have the menses during that period, or has up to three menses, but she's not taken out of the territory of war before her husband is taken, their marriage shall continue. So, and the reason for quoting this, that specifically shows that if the husband is present, then no sexual relations are allowed. And that goes completely against the argument put forward by Abu Adam, or those from whom he gets his doubts. Now the third thing I want to evidence is a little bit about the procedure of how any distributions would occur. Now, the men have fled, as was evidenced earlier, left the women in the battlefield and with their children. And what then happens is that these are taken captives and they're essentially held until they can be taken out of the theatre of war before then a distribution would take place. Once a distribution happens, there then begins a waiting time. And I will read uh, a quote for this. And this is from uh, uh, Sunan of Abu Dawood, hadith number 2152. Uh, Abu Sayyid al Khudri narrated the following statement from the Messenger of Allah, may God's peace and blessing be upon him, relate regarding the captives of Altas. There must be no intercourse with a pregnant woman until she gives birth, or with one who is not pregnant until she has had one menstrual period. Uh, another Hadith again in Sunan of Abu Dawood, and this is a hadith number 2153, the following hadith. And it says, Narrated Ruwaifi ibn Thabit al Ansari, should I tell you what I heard the Messenger of Allah, may peace be upon him, said on the day of Hunayn, it is not normal for a man who believes in Allah on the last day to water what another has sown with his water, meaning intercourse with women who are pregnant. It is not lawful for a man who believes in Allah and the last day to have intercourse with a captive woman until she is free from a menstrual course. It is not lawful for a man who believes in Allah on the last day to sell spoil till it is divided. So why am I quoting this? For a couple of reasons. Abu Adam is trying to give the idea that as soon as the battle was over, these women were immediately raped. And this has been refuted completely. Now this hadith gives you some of the idea of how the process was to occur. So the women and children who are left in the battlefield would be uh, captured, they are held together, and then these women and children are removed from the theatre of war to a place of safety. If they're captured with their husbands, then the marriage subsists, as I've already evidenced, and the marriage would continue, no relations would be allowed. If their husbands have been killed, or their husbands have abandoned them, and these women are then removed to uh, another land, out of the theatre of war, Um, then there is no existing marriage at that time. It just simply doesn't exist. Who are they married to? Then what would happen is that the government would allocate these women to the households and then a waiting period would occur. Um, And this is very straightforward. So the idea that somehow these women were immediately raped is is a completely false idea. And the final point that I want to make is that rape is clearly considered by Islam to be a crime that carries a very serious punishment. So first let me give you two opinions of of classical Islamic scholars. So this is the view of Imam Malik, who was a fan of the Maliki school of jurisprudence. And he states in his Muatta, volume two, page 734, in our view, the man who rapes a woman, regardless of whether she is a virgin or not, if she is a free woman, he must pay a dowry, like that of her peers. And if she is a slave, he must pay her whatever has been detracted from her value. The punishment is to be carried out on the rapist and there is no punishment for the woman who has been raped, whatever the case. The second um, evidence is from Imam Shafi, who was the founder of the Shafi School of Thought. And this is found in Kitab al-Um, volume 3, page 253. If a man acquires by force a slave girl then has sexual intercourse with her after he acquires her by force, and if he is not excused by ignorance, then the slave girl will be taken from him. He is required to pay a fine, 
and he will receive the punishment for illegal sexual intercourse. And I repeat again, we know what the punishment is because that was the ruling of Umar against Tarir when he did the same. So it's very clear that Islam does not allow rape of women, whether they are slaves or not. So in conclusion, we know that the argument brought by Abu Adam in his video falls down for four main reasons. The first reason is that the argument he gives is an implicit argument. He is unable to produce any single explicit statement that shows any female war captive was raped at all, and especially in the presence of her husband. All he's able to do is make an argument from silence and make suggestions and insinuations um, using very emotive language to try and present what seems to be a coherent and reasonable argument. But however, an argument from silence is not a reasonable argument, particularly when there is lots of evidence to the contrary. The second reason the argument falls down is that it contradicts the known history of the Otas incident. Specifically, we know that the Pagans brought their women and children along with their wealth to the battlefield. We know that they abandoned the women and children and their wealth in the battlefield and fled. And we know that the Prophet Muhammad peace upon him did not distribute the women and children as war spoils because of hoping for a deputation to come so that he was able to return them. And we know that actually a deputation did arrive and the Prophet Muhammad peace upon him did return all the women and children back to their homes. This completely shatters the image and the... the um, suggestions that Abu Adam has brought in his video. The third reason that the argument fails is actually because of the statements within the Quran that specifically ask Muslims to do good to those whom they have their right hand possesses and even to facilitate their marriages if they if their female servants desire to get married elsewhere. Additionally we have statements within the Hadith where the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him who makes it a, a moral thing to do to educate and treat nicely and then free and if possible eventually marry your female slaves um, and we also know that the Prophet Muhammad peace upon him when he became aware that somebody had slapped their female slave he immediately ordered her to be freed if he didn't allow this slapping to occur it's very doubtful that he would allow something even more heinous to occur like a rape additionally we know that Umar may God be pleased with him also sentenced a soldier to death who had illicit sexual intercourse with a female war captive um, which is a very strong argument against the idea that rape of female war captives is allowed and in the fourth place where this argument falls down is that it goes against the known positions of the Islamic scholars on the rights of female war captives which I've mentioned in a little bit of depth in the video already and the important part of this section is that Rape is a heinous crime in Islam which is punishable usually by capital punishment irrespective of if the woman who is raped is free or a slave woman and the punishment is only given to the rapist and usually is a capital punishment. So what I would say to Abu Adam is uh, I understand that you have doubts and I understand that there are lots of uh, people out there who like to spread these doubts. I would humbly suggest that you don't spread your doubts without first checking them out. Uh, in, in a lot more detail and there are many people that you can ask and in the video link below I've put lots of other excellent and probably more detailed responses than mine as well as some resources for you to gain further information from Assalamu alaikum YouTube